The Peter Schiff Show. I have been traveling all of last week and continue traveling this week. I am out in Southern California now. I was in Las Vegas for most of last week. I was attending Freedom Fest, and given all of the things I've been doing and the traveling, I just have not had the time uh, to record a podcast, but I wanted to make sure and make some time today to get something out there so that at least those of you who look forward to my podcast will have something to tide you over until next week when I will have more time again uh, to be recording these podcasts. You know, at Freedom Fest, I actually had another Bitcoin debate, and one of my clients happened to be in the audience, and he has a pretty good copy of the debate. He was going to be sending it to me. I don't know what happened, but as soon as I get a copy of it, I will be posting it on the YouTube channel. Hopefully, that will happen this week. I'm really not sure what the holdup is. He was having a hard time, I guess, uh, loading it up to a Dropbox. It was over an hour uh, debate, but this time, I actually won. Remember, the last time, technically, I lost the debate at the Soho Forum uh, because, you know, the audience basically decided to vote against Bitcoin so they could change their minds and vote in favor of it to make my opponent win. But this time, it was a much larger audience, and I guess uh, they weren't able to rig it because my side won. I wasn't by myself. It was me and another guy, and we had two opponents uh, debating Bitcoin And they did the same type of poll as they did in the first debate. Basically, it was the undecideds that that went my way. Everybody that came into the debate uh, in favor of Bitcoin, nobody changed their mind. Everybody that came in thinking it was a bubble, none of those guys changed their mind. So the people who already had a position were pretty much wedded to that position. It didn't really matter what we said. Uh, They basically stuck to their guns. It was the people who said they were undecided. They weren't really sure one way or another. And at the end of the debate, more of the ones of the undecideds went to our camp uh, versus the opponent's camp. But the most interesting aspect of all of this is now I did this debate maybe five days ago. And I continue to search the Internet and there isn't a single article about the debate. Now, there are probably a dozen different articles by various uh, uh, crypto publications about the debate I lost. And every headline is how I lost, how I got vanquished, how I got defeated, you know, lots of coverage of that smaller debate in, in Soho. But this much larger debate with a bigger audience, no coverage at all. Now, I'm sure had I been on the losing side of that debate, there would have been plenty of articles written about how Peter Schiff lost again and Bitcoin prevails. But now that I'm one for one, you know, this debate that I've won, it gets no press at all. So this is kind of uh, the way the coverage is always slanted in that community because the whole idea is to try to encourage more people to buy, uh, to keep the scheme going. And if you promote the fact that there was a debate in which Bitcoin lost, in which the audience didn't think Bitcoin was going to keep going up, in which they thought it was a bubble, why would they want to point that out? You know, also on this trip, I did record that Joe Rogan podcast. If you've been wondering where it is, Joe has kept it on ice. He's on vacation all of this week. And so I think he's going to be Uh, releasing it later in the week. You know, normally these things go live, but he's traveling, so he wanted to have some in the can. So I do think that you will be able to hear uh, the interview later in the week. So that can also tide you over if you're, uh, you know, jonesing for some uh, content here and I'm just too busy to provide it. You know, one thing I talked about on the Rogan podcast was a story that broke the same day of my last podcast, which I thought was very interesting. Uh, And it was about Donald Trump being sued by his former personal driver, who still works for the Trump organization, by the way. He's worked there for over 25 years. But until Trump became president and got a taxpayer-paid driver, he had to pay his own driver. And I think the guy was getting about a $70,000 a year salary, which to me seems about right uh, for a driver. I mean, uh, I've had one. I know what these guys uh, are paid. 
But the guy sued Trump organization because he claims that he was due overtime and he didn't get paid overtime. Right Now, he's worked for Trump organization for 25 years. Right? He's known what he was being paid all those years, never once complained, and now after 25 years, he wants to use the labor laws to retroactively force the Trump organization to give him a pay hike. I mean, first of all, he's not an hourly employee. It's not like he's punching a clock and uh, the organization asked him to work overtime. Basically, according to what I read, the guy needed to be on call for Trump. Maybe it was something like 10 hours a day. So then, you know, times or, or maybe a little more, 10, 11 hours a day. So maybe 50, 55 hours a week he was on call in case Trump needed him. But that doesn't mean that he was driving all that time. He just had to be, you know, you know, accessible to Trump. I mean, he couldn't go on a vacation or leave town, but, you know, he could watch a movie, he could read a book, he could, you know, he could trade stocks on the internet, uh, he could do whatever he wanted. I mean, he had plenty of free time between having to drive Trump around. So it's not like he was just, you know, constantly working uh, all, those, all those hours. But the point is, he knew what the pay was, and he knew how many hours he needed to be available to achieve that amount of pay. And so he could have divided the number of hours by the amount of pay and figured out if it was worth it for him uh, to work that number of hours for that amount of pay, right? I mean, that was it. It's not like when you get hired and you're doing an hourly job and you expect to be working 40 hours a week and then your employer says, look, you got to work overtime uh, some of these days. And now all of a sudden, okay, well, I'm going to get extra money because I, I didn't sign up for overtime. I signed up for, you know, 40 hour job. And now you're asking me to work overtime. He knew exactly what the deal was. And he chose to work under those conditions. You know, what, what happens in America is employees like to go back in time and rewrite the deal more favorable to them. If this driver did not like the terms of his employment, he had two options, right? He could have gone to Donald Trump and say, hey, Donald, you know, I'm working, I'm on call 10 hours a day. Uh, that's more than a normal eight-hour job. You're paying me $70,000 a year. I need 80. I need 90. If you want me to be on call that many hours, you need to pay me more money, right? He could have said that to Donald Trump. And then Donald Trump would have had two options, pay him more money or find another driver. And if the driver didn't like the employment conditions of that job or the compensation package, the amount of hours he had to be available, he was free to drive for somebody else who didn't need as many hours or would pay more money or didn't have to be a driver at all. He could do something else, right? That is fair, right? That is freedom for both parties. You know, how, what would happen if Donald Trump, after 25 years of employing this guy, decided to say, you know what? I think I paid you too much. I know I agreed to pay you $70,000 a year, but I don't think you did that good a job. I think I only should have paid you $60,000 a year. So I'd like $15,000 a year back for the past several years. I want you to give me some of your wages back. Nope, everybody would say that you can't do that. A deal's a deal, right? Well, why isn't a deal a deal when it comes to the employee voluntarily working under an arrangement that was freely negotiated by both parties? This guy is paid way more than the minimum wage, so it's not even a, a violation of that. And I'm sure that had they set this deal up as a salary, Trump could have come up with a salary scheme where he got paid a certain amount by the hour and then time and a half for the overtime where the whole thing would have worked out to the exact same compensation that this guy got and, and that everything would have been fine. But because it was a salary job, now he's trying to exploit these ridiculous labor laws to extort money from his former employer. And he's probably also doing it too because of the publicity. Maybe he thinks, oh, you know, Donald Trump is going to settle. He's president. He doesn't want to deal with this. You know, this is part of the reason that it is so difficult to be an employer in America. Look, Donald Trump's a very rich guy. Uh, he can afford to deal with this lawsuit. He's got lawyers on staff, right? He's got them on retainer. Uh, so for him, this is not that big a deal other than maybe the political uh, problem. But, you know, if he wasn't in the limelight and he was a billionaire and his driver sued him, he can handle it. But what about the small employer, mom and pop guy uh, who hires people and then they come back and they sue retroactively for overtime pay, right? They might not have the money. It, 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 they might have to even, who knows, they might have to borrow the money. 
uh, to pay their legal bills or because they can't afford to pay the legal bills, they might submit to the extortion and give their employee uh, money rather than pay it to a lawyer. But also, you know, I talked on the Rogan show a little bit and I think Joe even seemed to be surprised uh, by this knowledge. But I talked to him about the damage that overtime laws do to workers, right? They don't hurt employers, right? Everybody thinks, oh, this is great. We're going to force those greedy employers who work their uh, workers overtime, we're going to force them to pay time and a half, right? So if they're paying $10 an hour, and if you want your employees to work over 40 hours a week because you're a mean, greedy employer, and you're trying to work them to death, you're like a slave driver, well, now you're going to have to pay $15 an hour, right? And that's the big government, right? They got the votes of the workers. Vote for me and I'll force your boss to pay you extra when he wants you to work overtime, right? So this is great, right? This is government delivering something for nothing to the workers because even if your pay is $10 an hour, well, your boss is going to have to pay you $15 an hour. But the problem is the boss doesn't have to pay anything because he doesn't have to allow you to work more than 40 hours a week. And what I explained to Joe Rogan was a lot of the overtime hours were at the request of the hourly worker who wants to earn more money. See, if you're paid by the hour, you can give yourself a raise, just work more hours. And a lot of times, workers would do that. For whatever reason, they need more money. Uh, maybe an emergency comes up or something happens. They're trying to buy a big ticket item. And they might go to their employer and say, hey, I need some extra money. Can you pencil me in for some extra hours? You know, I'd like to work more so that I can earn more, right? Those are the relationships that existed before the government-mandated requirement to uh, pay overtime. But what happens now is when a worker comes to his boss, and this is not a new phenomenon. I mean, this has been going on for a long time because this requirement has been in the law for a long time in you know, most places. If the worker comes to his boss and, and says, hey, I want to work overtime, the boss says, well, I wish I could accommodate you, but unfortunately I can't because if I let you work more than 40 hours a week, I got to pay you time and a half. And I really can't afford time and a half. I'd rather just bring on another worker for those extra hours and let him work part-time. Or if I need another full-time guy, I'm just going to do that. I don't want anybody to work more than 40 hours a week because I don't want to pay $15 an hour for a job that's worth $10 an hour. So now what does that worker need to do if he wants more hours? He's got to go find another employer where he can work a second job, moonlighting, right? I got to go find another job with a different employer so I can work more than 40 hours a week because the new employer isn't subject to those requirements. So if I work 40 hours a week for one employer and then 20 hours during the same week for a different employer, I'm working 60 hours, but I'm not getting any overtime because there's two separate employers. But here is the problem. The worker is the loser, because now the guy's got to commute from his full-time job to his part-time job. And during that commuting time, that's dead time. Don't, don't get paid for that. Maybe it's an hour commute back and forth. Traffic. What about the gas money to get from one job to the other job? And what about if the hours aren't exact, right? What if, you know, your guy goes from one job to another job, but he can't stop working immediately? Maybe he's got to wait a half an hour before his shift kicks in. So all that is dead time. So now... The, the workers are, are inconvenienced and their, their total pay is less. And generally, too, maybe I'm working full time at one employer and he's giving me $10 an hour and he would give me an extra $10 an hour if I wanted to work some extra hours, but he can't. He's unwilling to pay time and a half, but he wouldn't continue to pay me at $10 an hour if he could, but he doesn't have that legal option. So now the worker gets another part-time job, but maybe the best part-time job he can find is $8 an hour. So now he's working overtime, but instead of getting more because of the government, he's actually getting less. Without the overtime laws, he could have got $10 an hour from his existing employer, but because he has to seek out a secondary employer, the best he could do is $8 an hour. So because the government made it illegal or made it too expensive for his employer to allow him to work overtime, he's got to work overtime for less money. He's getting $8 an hour. And it makes sense because maybe he's not as good as, at his part-time job as he is as his full-time job. He's not as productive at the part-time job. And so the part-time employer can't 
uh, pay him as much money. Meantime, let's say his current employer has to go and hire somebody else to do those extra hours, and maybe that guy's not as productive. He's not as good. Maybe he goes out and hires another guy for nine bucks an hour. But now you have the full time worker who might be working right next to a part time worker where that full time worker could have done a better job and he would just as soon work the extra hours, but the law makes it illegal, so he's got to go to his other job. So you know the, the bottom line is the government screws all this up. The best thing for the worker is to maximize his flexibility in how many hours he works and how he's compensated. But when the government comes in and says, you are not allowed to work for the same employer for more than 40 hours a week, you limit the worker's ability to maximize his income from employment. You're not hurting the employer because the employer just hires somebody else. That's how the employers get around the overtime requirement. Just hire part-time workers, have more people on the job, and spread the hours over a larger group of people. And voila, you've avoided the requirement but the people who suffer are, again, the very people who the laws are intended to help, which are the workers. And again, that is the fatal flaw. That is the unseen problem of all these liberal good intention laws is that the people who suffer the most from the laws are not the greedy rich businesses that are the target of the laws, but the workers, the average guy who is being sold a bill of goods as being the beneficiary of those laws. Now, speaking of unintended consequences, I read an article last week about BMW moving production of one of its factories out of the United States to China in response to the trade war. And the reason for that is now if China is going to be imposing tariffs on cars being produced in the U.S. and moving to China in retaliation for the tariffs that Trump is imposing, well, BMW doesn't want to build those cars in the U.S. anymore because now it's too expensive, so it's moving the plant to China so that it can sell the cars in China without the tariff. See, unintended consequences where the trade war ends up costing uh, American exporters jobs, good-paying manufacturing jobs, because now they have to move out of the United States to avoid the tariffs uh, that are being imposed in response uh, to the tariffs that Donald Trump uh, has enacted. Oh, by the way, since my last podcast, Trump did announce Kavanaugh as his Supreme Court pick. And, you know, of course, you know, relative to the nomination that Hillary Clinton or Barack Obama would have made, yes, this is certainly uh, way above the caliber of judicial activist, hard left justice uh, that would have been appointed uh, by either of those two. And so from that respect, yes, this is one of the positives of having Donald Trump as president is that we do get Supreme Court picks that are not quite as bad as the picks that we would get from the left. But again, nothing substantive is going to change here. I mentioned that before in my last podcast. None of the unconstitutional laws, rules, taxes that are currently in effect are going to be repealed, right? Kavanaugh still says he believes in precedent and he's not going to overturn precedent, which I think is nonsense. If you have bad precedent, you need to overturn it. I don't care how long a bad law has been on the books. The minute you have a chance to right the wrong, you do it, right? Because it doesn't matter if we're used to something bad, if the government has gotten away with something in the past. That doesn't mean they continue to get away with it in the future. So if you're on the Supreme Court and you recognize here is a law where the government has usurped power, the government is doing something that is forbidden by the Constitution, you need to overturn bad precedent and force the government to live within the confines of the Constitution. Because if you don't do that, the Constitution means nothing. And if you don't go back and correct the prior wrongs, then the future wrongs are going to continue. Because it, they're always going to be able to rely on that precedent until you overturn it with new, better precedent by saying these issues were wrongly decided in the past, right? The, the issues that came before the Supreme Court 50 years ago, 75 years ago, during this progressive era, with, you know, when Roosevelt stacked the court and then we got all these bad judges, all these things that were ruled constitutional are not. Right? The way the, the court expanded the Constitution by exploiting uh, the Commerce Clause or the Necessary and Proper Clause, all of this is nonsense. 
Uh, none of these powers can be construed from the original meaning of the document. The language is clear. If you believe in original intent, if you want, if you believe the Constitution means what it says, then you've got to go back and undo all the wrongs that were done by activist judges in the past who ignored the Constitution under the guise of interpreting it. I mean, basically right now, all the hoopla over Kavanaugh has to do with whether or not he's going to overturn Roe versus Wade, right? And I understand for a lot of people, abortion is a big issue, but the, the role of government, the fact that the Supreme Court has abdicated its responsibility in the checks and balances system, the fact that it no longer checks anybody or balances anything, it is there to make sure the government, the other two branches, the executive and uh, the legislature, uh, abide by the Constitution, right? It is the cop making sure the other branches of government follow the rule of law laid down by the Constitution, and they're not doing it. And that is the bigger picture argument that we should be having, but that we are not having. Oh, I forgot to mention, too, while we're on the, the subject of uh, trade, or while I was a minute ago talking about BMW moving production of autos back to China, last week we got the monthly trade figures, uh, and China's trade surplus on a monthly basis hit a new all-time record high. All-time record high. So for all the talk, or all the not just talk anymore, so far with, with tariffs that have been introduced, China's surplus has never been this high, and America's deficit has never been this high. And again, this is not the problem. This is a reflection of the problem. This is the symptom of an ailing U.S. economy that is incapable of production. And the fault lies not in China, but in ourselves. It's our own rules and regulations and Federal Reserve that have so corrupted our economy and so distorted our savings and investment patterns that we are no longer uh, productive and we rely on China uh, to produce the goods that we can't. And we rely on the Chinese to loan us the money that we don't save. Again, what nobody seems to want to admit is that the short-term benefit of these huge trade deficits is that Americans enjoy lower consumer prices than otherwise would be the case because there's far more abundance on the shelves of products that but for these deficits would not be here and Americans would be bidding up the prices on what goods we have left. So we get lower prices, and we get lower interest rates because China and everybody else who has a trade surplus with the United States recycles those surpluses by buying treasuries, buying mortgages, buying corporate bonds, buying stocks. So our financial markets are artificially elevated and then interest rates artificially suppressed as a result of these trade deficits. So we are living high on everybody else's hog. In the long run, yes, we're, this is going to be a disaster, but in the short run, we derive a temporary artificial boost to our living standard. That would be lost if the trade deficit collapsed like Donald Trump wants, if all of our trading partners stopped uh, providing us with credit and only traded with us to the extent that we could trade with them in equal quantities. If China demanded real consumer goods in exchange for their consumer goods and didn't give us stuff on credit and we had balanced trade, it would be the American standard of living that would implode and the Chinese standard of living would actually rise because now the Chinese consumers would have more stuff. They would have the products that we're currently buying that they're not. They're going without stuff. They're shipping stuff to us. Yes, they wouldn't have as many dollars, but what good are they? They're just a bunch of paper. We create that out of thin air. In fact, it's not even paper. You know, We don't even give them paper. right? That would at least have some value. Maybe they could burn it. They could use it as toilet paper. I mean, it wouldn't be the best uh, stock for toilet paper, but I mean, what can they do with the digital dollars that we create, right? They have absolutely no uh, residual value, right? It's just purely uh, nothing out of thin air. So be careful what you wish for, because pretty soon we are going to get it. You know, by the way, on prices too, even though the Chinese and our trading partners are helping to suppress consumer prices, we got the price numbers last week for both CPI and PPI, and Consumer prices were up 2.9% year over year. That is the biggest annual rise in six and a half years, right? The Fed talks about we're trying to get up to 2%. We're at 2.9, 2.9 year over year. We have blown through 2%, yet they're still going to be talking about how their goal is 2% and we're still making progress to our goal. And meanwhile, they've blown through their goal. We're headed through 3% very soon. In fact, the PPI is already through the 3% barrier. Year over year, the PPI 
is up 3.4%. That is also a six and a half year high. And what does that tell you? If producer prices are rising at 3.4% and consumer prices are only rising at 2.9%, what does that mean? That means consumer prices are heading higher because the producer, those are wholesale prices, they then pass along those higher prices to the consumer. So in many cases, when you see prices rising, the prices that might rise first would be on the wholesale level, on the producer level, and there's a bit of a lag between the prices rising on the producer level and when the producer then increases his prices to the consumer so that he can recoup the higher prices. That's how it works. You're moving up the chain. And so this is a good indication that future CPI increases are going to be hotter, right? Not cooler. Now, if that doesn't happen, then that would mean that corporations are just going to have smaller margins, right? They're just going to eat the cost themselves, which would mean that their profits would fall, right? But the stock market doesn't reflect that, right? Either profits are going to fall or consumer prices are going to rise, right? One or two of those things has to happen. And my guess is it's likely to be uh, rising prices and falling profits. I think both are going to happen because as producers pass on higher prices to consumers, then those consumers buy less stuff, right? They pay more money for what they do buy, but because they don't have an unlimited amount of money, they buy less. And so the businesses end up with lower sales. And assuming the margins are the same, they have lower profits. In fact, you know, we also got this week, you know, the uh, retail sales, which continue to rise, right? We're continuing to look at higher retail sales numbers, but gasoline prices at the pump are up 22% year over year. And a big chunk of the increase in retail sales is at gas stations. But prices for gas are actually up more than 22%, I think, year over year. But what's happening is, yes, consumers are spending more money for gas because gas is more expensive. But I think they're actually buying less gas because since it costs more, uh, maybe people are driving less. They're trying to use less gas to spend less money on gas. But if you just measure the raw amount of money spent, which is what retail sales does. There is no adjustment for inflation. They don't care what things cost. They just measure what you spend, not what you buy. So if you spend more and get less, that's still a positive as far as the retail sales numbers are concerned, but it's not a positive as far as the consumer is concerned. Nobody wants to spend more and get less. You want to spend less and get more. You know, one of the things too that Trump is doing to try to slow the increase in prices, which this is, you know, a tsunami. It's going to be building and building. We've got years and years of money printing of QE and 0% rates. So this is just the beginning. This is the tip of an inflationary iceberg that we're seeing now. People are ignoring or don't even realize what's awaiting uh, beneath the surface. But one of the things that Donald Trump announced over the weekend was that he's going to tap into the America Strategic Petroleum Reserve in order to counteract the increase in gas price. So obviously Trump is worried about how rising gas prices may affect the economy. It's like a tax hike. And so that would offset the benefits of his tax cuts, at least the temporary benefits, although the, the tariffs are also tax hikes. Uh, so he's offsetting his own benefit there. But he also is probably worried about if prices keep rising, how that might uh, impact the elections in November if voters are upset because it costs them so much money to drive to the polls. Uh, they may decide to vote for the party that's not in power, blaming the party in power for the increase. So Trump is trying whatever he can uh, to uh, get the price down by talking about tapping into the petroleum reserve. Now, maybe he's just talking. Maybe he's just, you know, this is open mouth operation to intervene in the oil market. Maybe Trump won't actually do it. But Maybe he will. And in fact, if the market continues to rise and he just talks and doesn't do anything, then, you know, people will realize he's all bark and no bite. So he may, in fact, tap into the strategic petroleum reserves. But why do we have those reserves? I mean, what is the purpose of a strategic reserve? I think the idea there came after the oil embargo uh, with the arrows. The idea is that if supply is disrupted, we want to make sure that we have uh, ample supply that we can rely on. Now, of course, now we have, do we have, you know, maybe we have more uh, domestic production that we've had at times in the past, 
Uh, but still, we don't have nearly as much production domestically to meet the needs that we have. That's why we still import so much oil. So the purpose of this strategic reserve is to have it for an emergency. An emergency is not just higher prices. As long as we have supply, as long as the, the oil is there, then there's no need to tap into the reserve. It's when the, the supply is disrupted. When there is no oil at any price, uh, that's when you need it. Right? Or if we need it you know, for military purposes, right? I mean, so we can, we can tap into that, that oil. But if we just blow through the oil when the only emergency is political, when Donald Trump simply thinks it's bad optics to have higher oil prices in front of an election, and he says, hey, let's just sell off our strategic reserves, okay, fine. Well, what happens when we get rid of all of our strategic reserves? Now we don't have any. Now what do we do if there's emergency? And of course, if oil prices are going to keep rising, and that, I believe that they are, and we decide to blow up our strategic reserves now, what happens when we try to replenish those reserves? What if oil prices keep rising, and now the government needs to replenish the reserves it tapped, but oil prices are much higher? And so now we have to buy back oil and pay a lot more for it than what we got when we dumped it on the market for political reasons. So I think this, again, is a mistake. And you know, if Trump wants to understand one of the reasons why oil prices are rising, don't look at OPEC, look in the mirror. Because prices rise as a consequence of inflation. And what creates inflation? Budget deficits that need to be monetized. Inflation is a monetary phenomenon. It is the government printing up money and buying bonds. And when you increase the budget deficits, which is what Donald Trump agreed to do by signing a big tax cut, and big spending increases almost you know, within the same month. So Trump voted or signed two bills to make deficits bigger, which means he signed two bills to uh, create more inflation because the Fed is going to be monetizing these larger deficits. And the result of that is that prices are going to go up for all sorts of things, not just oil. But you, know, you can't blame uh, producers for raising prices when consumers are trying to buy those products with you know, inflated dollars with dollars of uh, depreciated value. But I expect more of this scapegoating, finger pointing, blame game. I mean, the government, when the effects of inflation finally become manifest in higher prices, the last thing that politicians or central bankers want to do is accept responsibility for what they've done. So they always look for somebody else to blame and, and find other ways to try to deflect the damage for themselves. I mean, that's why the government... Uh, you know, was driving the the move to change the definition of inflation, right? They didn't want inflation to be an increase in the money supply because if that's how you define inflation, well, we all know who controls the money supply and why it's increasing. So if they can change the definition of inflation to rising consumer prices, right, which is just an effect of inflation, but not the inflation itself, now the government can blame other people. Right? Because it's not the government that's raising the prices. right? They control the money supply, but they don't raise prices. So now they can blame greedy corporations, greedy businessmen, OPEC. I mean, sometimes they blame labor unions, big labor for, you know, for a demanding wage hike. So they blame everybody but themselves. That's what happened during the stagflation too of the 1970s. Uh, you know, the government, Jerry Ford, whip inflation now. You know, infl government could whip inflation if it wanted to, but it doesn't want to. You know, Jerry Ford, you know, declared inflation uh, public enemy number one. And I think I mentioned this in a prior podcast. That was originally going to be the title of my father's book, The Biggest Con. It was going to be the U.S. government public enemy number one, but the the publishers, Random House, were shy. They didn't want to use that title. So they, they used a different title. But the reason my dad said that the U.S. government was public enemy number one was because Gerald Ford admitted that inflation was public enemy number one. Well, if the government causes inflation and inflation has got public enemy number one, well, then by definition, uh, the government was public enemy number one. And speaking of public enemy number one and the things that government does, the evil things that government does, I just read an article now that the IRS is finally invoking uh, one of the powers that was shoved into some kind of transportation bill that was passed a couple of years ago. And I remember I pointed it out at the time. You know, whenever they have a bill, a spending bill that everybody has to sign, they shove all kinds of bad uh, provisions into that bill and then people sign it anyway, right? Some of them, of course, don't even bother to read what they sign. Uh, but most people don't care. They just want to put their name on this bill because it delivers some type of benefit to some constituent and they don't want to 
you know, be seen as opposing whatever somebody is hoping to get from the government. Well, one of these provisions was that the IRS can uh, revoke the passport of a taxpayer that it believes owes money. And if you don't have a passport, the IRS can instruct the State Department uh, not to issue you one. And I think they're already starting. I read this article, maybe two, three hundred thousand or more passports are about to be revoked because the IRS claims that the taxpayer owes money. Now, again, this is not proven in a court, right? The an IRS agent has determined or has decided that there's some kind of deficiency and that you owe back taxes. Now, you ha it hasn't been adjudicated, right? Or maybe in some cases, maybe it has been. But even then, it's in a kangaroo court, right? Where it's tax court, which is not really a real court, where you don't have the same rights that you would have in an actual court. You know, the government, basically, the way they run the, the income tax, they basically say that the IRS is going to say this is what you owe. And if you don't believe them, or if you don't want to accept their finding, you could take them to a quote-unquote tax court, which is not really a court, right? It, they just call it a court because it sounds good. It's an administrative proceeding where the judge is not really a judge. He's really like another IRS agent, right? So you, you can take your grievance uh, to basically the government. The government says that you owe money and you claim you don't. And now you can go to court, go to a phony court, and try to prove to some other government agent that the government agent is wrong. But because you are suing them, right, you are the moving party, the burden of proof is on you, the taxpayer, that you don't owe the money. See, normally, if the government had to go into a real court, right, not, not, a, not a phony court, but an impartial actual judge, or maybe even a jury, because the government said, you owe this tax money, and you claim that you don't owe it. The government says you owe it, and they were suing you, the burden of proof would be on them. They would have to prove that you owe the money. Right. And, you know, so it's like innocent pro till proven guilty. So if you have the burden of proof, then you have a higher burden. Right. Because if I'm the person who's being sued, I, I, I don't have to prove I don't owe the money. It's the government that has to prove that I do. So it's a very higher hurdle for the government if they have to go into real court. But because they trick everybody into going into these phony courts, it's the taxpayer that now has to prove that he doesn't owe the money. And if he can't prove it, even if he doesn't owe it, but he doesn't have the proof, then he loses. So the whole thing is rigged from the start, right, these, these uh, tax courts. But the IRS, according to this regulation, even before there's been a tax court hearing, right, even though you may, in fact, have all the evidence you need to prove that the government is wrong, the IRS can still take your passport because they allege that you owe money. And so they're restricting your travel and this, again, is more usurpation of power where the government can keep you here against your will, not let you leave. We're taking away your passport because we claim you owe us money, and we're not going to let you leave until you pay up, right? Which basically transforms the United States into a debtor's prison, right? If you're in debt to the government, the government will not let you leave until you pay off that debt. You are stuck here, right? Now, who knows? I mean... They could trap lots of Americans here. Uh, what, what if they just say you can't leave? Because once you, you get the camel's nose under the tent, what if they say, hey, you know, every American is in debt, right? If you look at the national debt, uh, the per capita national debt in America now, I don't know what it is, you know, a couple hundred thousand dollars, right? You, you can go uh, to for the national debt clock. In fact, I'm going to go over there right now because that, that website has a lot of information on on debt, right? So if you if you go to that uh, website, it will tell you what their per capita debt in America, and this is just of the twenty one trillion dollars, right? So the per capita debt is sixty four thousand six hundred and forty four dollars per American, right? And that's just the twenty one trillion, twenty one point two trillion. That doesn't count everybody's share of the unfunded liabilities like Social Security, Medicare, and it doesn't uh, account you know, any of what you owe from to, to your state. But that's per citizen, right? That includes every man, woman, and child, right? That Little babies, people on welfare who don't pay anything. So if you just take the national debt by taxpayer, right, the people who file returns and pay taxes, the per capita debt is 174394 So each American citizen owes the U.S. government, I mean, its share of the debt, is 174394 So if you accept the precedent that the IRS 
can take away your passport, so you can't leave the country and you can't travel, right, because you owe the IRS money, then they can say, well, you can't leave the country unless you're willing to pay your share of the national debt, which is 174394 So you want to get out of this country, pay up. Write us a check right now for your share of the national debt. And until you're willing to do that, you can't leave. You got to stay here and keep working so we can keep taxing you so we can, you know, we can cover your share. But if you want to leave, then you got to pay off what you owe right now. I mean, this is basically the precedent that we're setting, which is that if the U.S. government determines that you owe some kind of outstanding obligation, and obviously your share of the national debt is an outstanding obligation, right? We're, you know, we're all on the hook for what the government has borrowed, uh, you know, under the taxpayer's name. But if the government can simply allege an obligation, and based on that obligation that they've alleged, they can restrict your ability to travel, well, then that's it. We've opened up Pandora's box, and who knows how some future government will exploit uh, this new power that has been uh, given to it, uh, and the Supreme Court does nothing. I mean, the Supreme Court should, you know, declare this unconstitutional, but of course, in order for it to be declared unconstitutional, somebody is going to have to uh, have their passport denied because they have a, ta uh, a tax debt, and then they're going to have to uh, go to court and sue and say it's unconstitutional, and they're going to have to lose, and they're going to have to appeal their way all the way up to the Supreme Court and win. Now, who has the money to do that, right? I mean, if you don't have the money to pay your taxes, you don't have your, the money to hire a lawyer and take something up to the Supreme Court. Now, maybe the ACLU or somebody will get involved and fund this thing, and maybe it'll be declared unconstitutional. But from my perspective, based on all the bad precedent that I've already talked about, they're not going to declare it unconstitutional because the government does whatever it wants because that's the precedent that we've already set, that the Constitution doesn't matter. They'll just say, oh, they'll just throw it into the Necessary and Proper Clause or they'll just throw it into the Elastic Clause or whatever it is, and they'll say this is perfectly fine and we go down this slippery slope to debtor's prison, which is why I've said when I was running uh, for Senate and why I continue to say now that we should not build that wall uh, that Trump wants to build because the ultimate purpose of that wall the main use is not going to be to keep the Mexicans out. It's going to be to keep the Americans in. Because, you know, once they revoke your passport and you can't legally leave the country, well, maybe you have to escape somehow. And if there's a big wall there, it might make it harder for you to escape. Let me just finish up the podcast by pointing out that the price of gold is falling today, the morning that I'm recording this podcast. This is the new low for the price of gold this year. So we're now down below 1230 uh, uh, in the price of gold, just barely uh, below 1230. So we made a marginal new low. Uh, we're getting a little bit further below 1250 than I thought we would. You know, the gold stocks are continuing to hold up very well in the face of the uh, decline in the price of gold. Gold stocks are not making a new low for the year, uh, at least not yet. Uh, and though they are down today, uh, they are not down nearly as much as you would assume uh, with a $10, $12 drop in the price of gold. In fact, a number of gold stocks are actually trading positive today uh, in the face of the decline in the price of gold. Again, I still think the traders have this wrong. They're still looking at the, the trade war as somehow being dollar positive. It's dollar negative. That is impacting gold. They are dismissing the increasing inflation numbers that we're getting as transitory because they think the Fed is going to hike rates more to fight the inflation, which is going to be good for the dollar and bad for gold. The reality is they're not going to fight the inflation. They're going to surrender. Inflation is going to win because if they fight inflation, they cause a worse financial crisis than 2008. They don't want to do that. So higher inflation is bad for the dollar, especially since by definition, Higher inflation means the dollar is losing purchasing power. If the dollar is losing purchasing power, it is losing value. It is not gaining value. So all of the big picture fundamentals are positive. You still have all these pie in the sky growth estimates. I think the Atlanta Fed is still looking for second quarter growth at 4.5%, although that optimism is not shared by all, not even at the Fed. The New York Fed, by the way, is only at 2.8% uh, for the second quarter, but Whatever the second quarter is, I think it's going to be the high point, the high watermark for the year, because look at what's going on uh, with uh, the trade war. Look at what's going on with consumer confidence. You know, July consumer confidence, we got that 
uh, last week unexpectedly declined. They were looking for another increase. It dropped. I mean, it's still pretty high, uh, but we may have reached the zenith of the false confidence. In fact, if you look at a chart of the hope for wage growth, that is starting to collapse. You know, people were very optimistic that wages were going to go up, but they're not. Uh, real wages have been stagnating. I think they're falling because I still think that we're under-reporting uh, the extent to which prices are actually rising. Uh, so I think wage earners are falling further and further behind. But for a while, there was some false optimism that Trump was going to change all that and they were finally going to get some wage growth. But I think by the time these workers go to the polls in November, they're going to be voting and they're not going to be earning any more money than when they voted two years earlier uh, for President Trump. And so with those hopes being dashed, uh, politically, that could be uh, quite dangerous for the Republicans. But also, as the hope for higher wages uh, fades, then the confidence numbers fade as well. And I think it's not just going to be the confidence numbers for the consumers that are going to fade, but of the producers. Look at all these purchasing matters and all these businesses. Small business confidence is re record high. Why? Because there's confidence that their, cons their consumer, their customers are going to have more money and then therefore they're going to buy more goods and services. But if that doesn't happen, as the, as the businesses, small business owners lose that confidence too, right? then this whole uh, you know, mirage of growth just vanishes. All this talk about how we have the greatest economy ever, it's all wishful thinking. right? It's all the field of dreams uh, economic policy, like if we pretend that we have a great economy, if we continue to lie over and over again about how great the economy is, that somehow miraculously uh, we're going to create a good economy by willing it into existence, by lying it into existence. But when that doesn't work and the truth sets in, that's when all hell breaks loose in these financial markets, in the currency markets, and in the political landscape. Because as I said many times before, you are misreading the tea leaves if you think this country has moved to the right. If you think the election of Trump means that we have an electorate that is more prone to accept the principles of lower government, few, lower taxes, more freedom. It's not. They were just grasping for straws. They still want something for nothing. They wanted something different. They voted out of despair. They voted out of hope out of the belief that maybe Trump will be different and he will be the magic elixir, right, that can finally deliver, uh, you know, what they need and, and, and lift them out of the circumstances that they're in. But believe me, if Trump doesn't deliver, they're willing to try something else. And they don't care if, what else, if the other thing that they try has never worked before, right? No matter how many times socialism fails, it still has a lot of appeal at the ballot box. And believe me, when you have disillusioned, disappointed voters, they will try anything if it promises to work better than what's already failed. Mm -hmm.